So uh, welcome to everyone. And uh, it's a wonderful, uh, beautiful afternoon here in State College. And uh, I'm not sure where our guests are joining us from around uh, on the chat space, but it looks like we have a pretty good group. I'm going to presume they're geographically dispersed. Uh, my name is Larry Reagan. I'm one of the directors at the Center for Online Innovation and Learning. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today to our COIL conversation. Uh, it, COIL conversations are a part of an outreach program that we do at COIL in order to highlight and showcase the amazing talent we have at Penn State. And uh, uh, who I'm going to introduce uh, in a moment falls into that category along with the colleagues he's brought along. Um, Jack Carroll is a, um, I'm, I asked him if I can get all this language right here, so, and I only have a half hour to introduce him, so bear with me here, but Jack's a distinguished professor of information science and technology. He's also the director for the Center for Human-Computer Interaction. Um, the, the label probably for Jack best describes him would be a social cognitive scientist. And he's had a variety of different research threads. If you're interested and want to see an interesting career, go to Jack's page and his various uh, uh, research initiatives are highlighted there. This one, however, that he's going to share with us today is an outgrowth of his work in large-scale classes through MOOCs and also through his online teaching, looking at how students can um, be better uh, trained, prepared for didactic conversation in these large spaces. And he's doing some really interesting creative work. Started with a project a number of years, maybe three or four years ago, called Piazza. Jack has taken that and sort of launched it into a larger format. And he's going to share that with us this afternoon. So we're really pleased and honored to have you with us today, Jack. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. I, I hope I can live up to the introduction. <laughs> OK. OK, so uh, these are some of my uh, collaborators. And they're actually are even more. Mary Beth Rossin is here today. Um, so to get to the point, we've been working on um, trying to leverage collaborative learning <clears throat> in our classes and online uh, for a number of years. And collaborative learning is one of the best techniques we know of to improve the quality of education. Uh, so I've listed a few things here. It's active learning is a good thing. Collaborative learning is inherently active because you have to communicate with other people. It's engaging because it's not just the material, it's socially engaging. It's authentic because it's how we actually live our lives, which is different from how we take courses sometimes. Uh, it's dialectic. We have to discuss points of view and reconcile points of view. It's self-expressive, again, inherently so, because people have to express themselves. Uh, people need to take responsibility, and they regulate themselves. So all these are good characteristics that in, in uh, instructional design and uh, learning. We talk about all the time. Collaborative learning has all those things. So I'm going to be talking about uh, the uh, collaborative critical thinking work we've been doing recently. And this is beyond previous work on collaborative learning, uh, which we did based on uh, work on case-based analysis and anchored discussions in classrooms. Uh, specifically, we appropriated Piazza, the Piazza QA system, that interesting character there, looks like a, a, mm. an E grob, <laughs> is, uh, is actually a possessive S, but you can translate that in the rest <laughs> of the slides. <laughs> uh, so we appropriated Piazza to uh, uh, construct Critical Thinker, we've, we've subsequently implemented it. We're doing more work with that. At the same time, we did um, some work on uh, MOOCs, as Larry was mentioning. And we're trying to connect those two strands of work in uh, some of the things that we're planning for the future. And those are things we'd like to talk with uh, you all about after I finish these introductory remarks. So this is um, Piazza. And I learned about this, actually, at uh, one of the uh, spring symposiums from Julia Craigno in uh, physics. And she uses it to help students, or to allow students, to collabor collaboratively develop high-quality questions and answers. 
And in a field like physics, that's appropriate because there are specific questions and they actually have answers. But the fields I've worked in aren't like that. But um, so we repurposed this and made the question pane a propane and the answer pane a con pane. So this is an example that in human computer interaction we call reappropriation. It's the easiest way to construct a prototype. Uh, this was uh, done very easily, <laughs> immediately. And you see in the content, you see some um, bracketed uh, headers like evidence for C1. Maybe not everybody can see that, but there are these, what these are is uh, tags derived from Toulmin's rhetorical theory, which we thought would further uh, support and um, guide students in constructing valid argumentation for their pro and con contributions to the uh, debate. This example, I'm not sure if anybody can read it. I can't actually read it, but, but it's, uh, it's drawn from the PRISM uh, controversy of a few years ago. And uh, so this also dates when the project started. And I should say this was supported by uh, COIL, uh, this initial uh, effort. So um, we had some findings from um, getting students to engage in this activity. Well, maybe I should say just another word about the activity. So what the students would do would in encounter complex materials. For example, they'd read a book an argumentative book, or they'd encounter a theory that they didn't know, or they'd uh, encounter you know, some kind of argument that I would cook up. And they would have to deconstruct that by uh, identifying pro and con points, identifying the dialectic that was implicit in the book, or in the theory, or in the argument that I was presenting to them. And the, the reason to do that is because the, if you can learn to do this yourself, then you can function as a citizen and a scientist and all the other roles that we're in that require us to think critically about material we encounter. OK, so in, that, uh, in light of that, in my course in particular, I, uh, I use this in IST 110, which is the introductory course. And I would assign students books like The Shallows. I don't know if you know this pretty famous book by Nicholas. Uh, it's not Cage. <laughs> Nicholas Card. Yeah. Uh, I always, well, obviously. Uh, but um, yeah, so The Shallows is, an, is a, a long and complex argument about how the internet makes us stupid in essentially in many ways. Um, and um, <clears throat> so they would identify the pro-con arguments in the book, and stu students were quite engaged by this. And in fact, there's a, one of our findings is that they felt they could think more critically, and they did think more critically uh, uh, through the series of class discussions. They read four books, so we were able to analyze four pro-con debates um, also, the quality of argumentation improved through time. We scored that using uh, Erdogan's coding scheme for Toolman argumentation, which of course was suited for us. And also, we analyzed the logic of the positions that they uh, took, and the con positions in particular came, became more logically independent as the course progressed, which is good. So they weren't just saying, they weren't just attacking the pros. Uh, line by line, they were constructing arguments. So those are some of the indications that we felt we were on the right track. And we have a paper which has actually appeared now that's in um, Educational Technology Research and Development. And so uh, since that initial work, we've uh, looked at robustness. And we've done that by implementing this in a series of courses. Uh, the 110 uh, course that I referred to, another course uh, taught by uh, colleagues of mine, 413, which is a senior elective in IST. And, uh, and here, instead of analyzing uh, my lectures and these uh, popular books on technology, they were analyzing uh, various usability engineering methods, which is 
quite a few and uh, which have uh, many trade-offs. And then finally, uh, the uh, PhD core course that I teach, which is uh, Foundations of Human-Centered Design, where we critically analyze uh, 12 HCI theories, and they use this tool to do that. And it, um, it actually was about equally effective in all these different uh, realms. The reason we want to look at this is because we're not only interested in 110, we're interested in a, a variety of educational applications and contexts. Based on all this, we uh, invested the time and effort to build the tool that we call Critical Thinker. And this is what this looks like. So some of the differences here are, if you noticed in the Piazza slide, the QA question answer panes that we reappropriated to be pro-con were oriented vertically which makes it hard, actually, to compare the argumentation. It's not, it's not natural, I think. So we, were, we addressed that in this design, as you can see. Uh, we also simplified the Toolman model, uh, which is now encoded uh, only in these uh, controls that you see. They can add backing with a plus. So there's sort of a, uh, an implicature there that uh, a claim you make pro or con should be backed up with something and um, but we we uh, have a light definitely a toolman light at this point and we also uh, support real-time text editing piazza if you're familiar with that is uh, operating on a very old model of updating shared information you can have all sorts of things with buffers colliding and losing data uh, this model updates character by character. In fact, it's pretty robust. You can type in more than one text pane at a time if you want. So it allows more flexible interactions. And uh, one of the ways it's been used recently is as a discussion tool in class, that is projecting it for everybody sort of the way this is, this is being done. I think we have a demo now. Yes. Critical thinker is designed to support dialectical argumentation with pro and con structure. The text is synchronously updated to all end users collaborating on the argumentation task. With this synchronicity, students can collaborate on a finer grain level. For instance, one student can work on proposing the proposition, whereas other students can come, with, come up with follow-up supporting points of view. Students can use different color-coded icons to indicate their typing status and differentiate among themselves. Students can use within system chat functions to facilitate this argumentation development process and help with the group coordination. In addition, for students unable to attend synchronous collaboration process, they can always come back to the site to look at the chat history. From there, they can browse over the chat history during which the argumentation is developed. That's more context can be reserved for future use. Critical Thinker provides multiple communication modes and channels for closed or asynchronous collaboration. OK, thank you, Na, again, for uh, producing that demo. All right, so the status of this uh, project is we're still refining and using a uh, critical thinker. It's actually harder to come up with a simpler design, a simpler system, than one that looks very complicated. 
I hope that looked very simple. Took a lot of work to get it there. And I'm using it this semester in my, in my um, IST 520 course. I, I used it last fall in uh, IST 110. It was used in 413, and another instructor has adopted it for 110. So we, we're, we're still pursuing that robustness goal and uh, finding basically uh, very positive uh, evidence and writing papers about it. About its glories. <clears throat> so um, another uh, thread in this work uh, has to do with MOOCs, as uh, Larry mentioned, and of course uh, e MOOCs or any other kind of uh, online learning experience is much more daunting for uh, collaborative learning. It's harder to do, it's done less, it's done more trivially. That's all certainly true in the case of MOOCs. And a second uh, COIL project that we had, in fact, was to look at uh, MOOC uh, experiences as opposed to MOOC analytics. There's quite a bit of analytic work on MOOCs, but much less qualitative work. So we did a study uh, analog uh, interviewing students and instructors who had uh, uh, taught or taken MOOCs. Uh, and what I'm commenting on here is just part of that work. This actually was quite productive, too, and there's, there's a ser series of four papers, one of which is being presented today, I believe. Um, but uh, with just looking at the motivation uh, fact for now, uh, we found that these motivations are quite diverse. This bears, incidentally, on the much-touted fact that MOOCs have terrible retention statistics. If you actually look at the motivations of people, quite a, quite a few MOOC students uh, have no intention of finishing the MOOC when they start it, which makes it sort of a bit dodgy, really, to call them dropouts. <laughs> but uh, there are quite a few different motivations. Some people have immediate needs, and some of these are quite narrow, like they may want to review one theorem. Uh, again, in which case, they're, they're not really dropouts. They're more like drop-ins. Um, people want to prepare for the future. They're just curious about something. The thing that I found most striking for the purposes of this short talk is that uh, one of their main motivations is to connect with other people. This is kind of a sad motivation in a way because, uh, as, as you probably know, MOOCs are quite poorly uh, provisioned for supporting connection to others. The main official tool is the forum, which is really uh, just about the worst collaborative uh, channel we could think of, anybody can think of now. Um, and so uh, basically, we, we find there's a, a big mismatch between MOOC features and this key motivation. Um, and people do a lot of workarounds for this, like people always do, they're creative about everything. And uh, in this case, you see quite a few Facebook groups associated with uh, MOOC um, offerings, and those are uh, much more active, and they differ quite a lot in terms of what's going on with respect to the uh, MOOC form tool. Anyway, this has, uh, this along with the work on critical thinker, led us to frame uh, the goal we have now, <clears throat> which is to, to implement critical thinker activities online and at scale. So this is a big step from what we've done. And uh, you know things could work very well in the context we've done them in and not online or at scale. So I think these are big open questions. And we formed a project with Marty Hurst at Berkeley and Scott Plummer at San Diego, who are two people who have worked on collaboration in MOOCs. Um, Scott has, uh, I, I'm sorry, Marty is uh, well known for her work on reputation systems in MOOCs, which, which I think is, is uh, quite important. And uh, if you start to think about MOOCs as not an anonymous environment, but really a learning community where people are identified and, and have the opportunity to work together. 
And Scott Clemmer is well known for his work on uh, the massive grading challenge and peer grading schemes that can be implemented uh, scalably, or I guess I should say scale-free. We've also worked with uh, Catherine Jablico and her collaborators who uh, created the Creativity Innovation at Change MOOC at Penn State. And we've uh, identified an activity in that MOOC that could be a first uh, activity to support with a uh, critical thinker. It's basically a critical analysis of idea generation methods, which is uh, an ideal uh, critical thinker uh, activity. And then finally with Coursera, who uh, impressively enough is quite interested in creating tools for forming and managing groups and sees this challenge of uh, collaborative learning at scale as a legitimate and important thing to do. So that's, this is our direction. And uh, with respect, the rest of what I'm going to say is really framing directions for conversation. So this is where I invite you to uh, help us, help get us on the right path. Um, so I'm going to uh, just uh, briefly decompose challenges into the experience of online collaborative learners and uh, social technical systems for managing groups at scale. So online and at scale can be really looked at as different challenges. In fact, one way to think of this is the online challenge includes, uh, say, a world campus course, which is not learning at scale, but it's learning online. A MOOC is both. So learning online, um, we're interested in integrating uh, critical thinker into online classes. Um, and the first thing we realize is the critical thinker activity is much broader than critical thinker. This would apply to a lot of things uh, people do in um, hybrid classes. Um, the, you know, so uh, if you think about the flow of the activity, students have to read or analyze something. They have group level pro con argumentation and then class level elaboration or synthesis. I mean, that's the schematically the way this acti these activities have been structured. But in the hybrid class, that is a face-to-face -face class with uh, online tools, uh, the first and the last one are done face-to-face uh, -face or done, uh, you know, leveraging the fact that it is a class. And only the pro-con argument is done online. And even there, some of the work is done in uh, Google Docs. I mean, we know because we've, we've surveyed the practices of the students. So we need to conceive of the activity more broadly and support kind of end, the activity end to end because there isn't any face-to-face uh, -face class to retreat to. So this really changes what the tool is about, what it has to cover, what it has to address. Um, Evaluation and feedback for the various phases of the critical thinker activity also become more problematic online. Uh, these uh, evaluation and feedback functions are, of course, carried out by the, uh, to, well, it can be carried out by the instructor. Some of the evaluation is peer evaluation, but that is also le uh, leveraging to a considerable extent the face-to-face -face opportunity. And, yeah, and note, importantly for the scaling thing, which is the next slide, it's also leveraging the fact that there's not that much data. So, I mean, I read all of these things, <laughs> but I can't read thousands. <laughs> um, so, uh, we, um, um, I'm drawing a blank on the point, <laughs> the next bullet. So maybe I'll bring my collaborators into this. No, enhance and articulate interactions among students. Have I? Uh, maybe that's why I can't figure it. <laughs> OK, so uh, yes. So we would like to use uh, online tools to uh, uh, provide feedback back to uh, students. So for example, 
I don't have to visualize things if I can uh, interact with them face to face and explain things. But on a larger scale, it might be very useful to leverage uh, visualization tools or automatic analysis or uh, peer analysis, other other kinds of approaches to uh, uh, getting getting uh, feedback and analysis together. And uh, most of all, as a point I made earlier about the original tool, we have to keep this very simple because if it gets, if it has to get much more complex to do all this, uh, it may not work. I mean, it's working now, but that's partly because it really is a walk up and use system. It's uh, quite simple. Um, and with respect to scaling, there's a simple sense of scaling, which is just handling larger uh, data sets. And we're already exploring uh, another one of these reappropriation strategies, and that is to use Google Sheets and to create a custom sheet, which is the critical thinker um, template. And that seems uh, pretty doable. It's not really attractive currently, but, but we can work on that. Uh, it is scalable, though. It's scalable because it's Google. And of course, this, you know, again, from our point of view, this is not what we want to work on anyway. We'd like to be able to use infrastructures that infrastructure builders have built, if that's possible to do. But the more interesting kind of scaling is the socio-technical scaling. So creating and managing thousands of small group collaborations which is what at scale entails, uh, is really challenging. So for instructors in here know instantly, you know about the hazards of, of uh, collaborative learning. And that is, uh, Johnny can't get al along with Richard. And what are you going to do about that? Move people from this group to that group. And the, again, these things are all very doable. And we do them. But we, they don't scale. I mean, so there have to be other kinds of solutions, other approaches that are either automatic or uh, involve some kind of minimal effort. You can't do it by hand. Um, and in general, uh, the problems of group conflict and group management and, and so forth, these are very important elements of group learning, partly why collaborative learning is so valuable, but uh, they need to be scaled. They can't be done by hand. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, the, 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 uh, the jigsaw, which refers to different students playing a role in their partner's learning in a way that uh, permute, permutes through the whole class. Again, very easy to instrument in a class of 20 or 40 people. Really not so obvious how to do it uh, at scale. And yet, it's essential. I mean, jigsaws are really why collaborative learning works. Um, and then uh, finally, scaling feedback and assessment. And I think I've kind of covered this already. Distributing and automatic fee feedback, grading effort, all the stuff that is reasonable to do uh, online or certainly face to face. But at scale, it, it needs to be uh, automated. And as I mentioned, People like uh, Scott Clemmer have uh, started to work on this problem already. So um, to wrap up, um, we're uh, decomposing these threads of continuation into challenges online and challenges at scale. Both of them uh, need investigation and development. And uh, we're, uh, this partnership I alluded to before, we wrote a proposal to NSF uh, based on some of the ideas I've been reviewing here. We're awaiting the outcome of that. And uh, we're also uh, tentatively uh, going ahead, or we would like to go ahead with a, a small trial, although nothing small, uh, in, with the CIC MOOC. Um, and uh, we are exploring possibilities for appropriating Google infrastructure to save us the trouble. Mm -hmm. So. This is where I, I would love to get some answers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Uh, that, that was really interesting. And I've got just a small list of about 30 questions for you. So I, but, but since I'm the moderator, I get to ask the first question. And then I'll turn it, I'll turn it loose. One of, the, one of the points, first of all, I, I just think the, uh, the approach of looking at critical thinking as a skill set 
is what we ought to be preparing our learners to, to possess and maybe all of America, but we won't go there. Um, would re it, it just an, it's just a wonderful framework, yeah. Um, so, but I'm, 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 I've got two, these two thoughts confounded and I'm hoping you can tease them apart. One is the idea of critical thinking, what it means to do that analysis to establish pro and con relationships. I can do that as an individual. If you're my instructor, you can help me one-on-one -on -one do that. There's the second part then about the collaboration. So now I'm doing that activity in a larger, in a larger space. Can you help me understand that relationship? And what does the collaboration bring to that process in terms of, is it, in, does it enrich the experience? Yeah, I think it does. Um, so, so for example, the thing that's easiest for me to remember is my graduate class this spring, because I spent three hours teaching it this morning. Um, and uh, in that class, I have people uh, constructing these uh, critical analyses of the core theories of the human-computer interaction field. And then I have other teams whose job is to synthesize that critique. I mean, the way I've arranged it this semester, one team tries to articulate a set of pros and cons that capture why this theory matters, how it matters, and what its limitations are. The other team uh, looks at that argumentation and critiques it and tries to make sense of the, uh, the argumentation. So, and I find it's useful uh, to the students to work together on projects like this. I think you're quite right, a student could do this. I think it's even more valuable for them to discuss how to do it. Because a, a pro-con analysis is uh, designed. It, it's not, there's not just one solution. You know, take a com an object as complex as a theory. Today we were talking about activity theory. There, there aren't just five well-known pro-cons for that, and eventually they'll find them. Uh, it's really an, un, it's an, it's a design problem. I mean, it's really un, unlimited how many pro-cons you could find and how you could articulate them. And so I think it's a very good thing to work on collaboratively. Then I have the other team interacting with that team on their uh, thing. And then, of course, when we get to class, there are four teams, so the other two teams get into it. And I think it's useful at every stage. And in fact, this is a jigsaw, you know, people relating differently to the same objectives. So you're looking, you're examining the content on one hand, then you're examining the, co the process of the analysis on the other, and you're bringing those two together. Yeah. And there's a lot of metacognitive. Yep. So I'm just going to ask when we have a speaker just yeah. to uh, grab the mic so our guest online. Yeah, I was just going to connect it to, you know, sort of the cognitive and the metacognitive. And, you know, of course, critical thinking is uh, something that you have to have some metacognitive ability because you have to be able to reflect and sort of figure out which piece am I connecting to here? Am I being positive? Am I, you know, arguing mm -hmm. with myself? You know, that sort of thing. That's all metacognitive. And I think that's where a lot of the collaboration benefit can come to sure. because they, be, you know, your, your collaborators become sort of a bit like a mirror and a bit like mm -hmm. a board, you mm -hmm. know, it mm -hmm. bounces off and it also gets reflected in what they say and so on. So I think that even though they may not be talking the metacognitive talk, right. you know, they're doing it. Sure, sure. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Um, did you want to introduce Na and Ben and um, see if they had any input or? Uh, sure. So Ben Hanrahan and Na Sun have been two people who have been working with me, also Bikalp at New Pain over here. And uh, Seixing Zhang is at the CSCW conference presenting this work, as I mentioned, presenting the MOOC work. Ben, would you like to share any insights or observations? Uh, sure. So the um, piece we were just talking about, about the uh, how the collaboration is useful and whatnot. So I think that this is sort of at the core of what the difficulty in doing this online is, is to focus on the artifact of the critical thinker, which in this case, and I mean often is the case in education, it's a means and not an end. And so how do we support the, um, how we support the the activities that we're wanting to elicit mm -hmm. online, which is the um, 
the discussion and the in-class activities. How do you have in-class activities when there's no class? Yeah. So that's it's really, I think, the core of the problem as of the uh, two thrusts we were talking about, about the in the uh, world campus type of setting and in the MOOC. Can, can I ask, Ben, is it an issue of immediacy that you need to have the, the pro-con dialogue going on in sort of real time versus the synchronous nature? I post something and two days later, perhaps you come in and you post a response. Is it, is it that latency that's, that's part of the issue? I don't think so. It's phased right now, isn't it, Jack? I mean, there is some lag. It's not a like active when they're constructing the artifacts. It's not <coughs> right. So the, one, of the, one of the ways I, I use this activity is to keep students engaged through the week. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, so they meet with me every Tuesday morning, but they have stuff to do about every day and a half. That there's a deadline every week. So okay. this argumentation has uh, uh, checkpoints. Develops over time. Yeah. I see. I see. But then it culminates in class, which obviously needs to be very low latency. Yeah. Because then they're having the discussion in class, which I think is really the end goal of the activity. Sure. Thank you. Ship might be I on. Can't resist. <laughs> no. I, just, I, I wanted to say a little bit more about the synchronous versus the asynchronous. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you have this kind of synchronous collaboration, whether it's face to face or if we can create it online, um, is you get a bit more of the um, evaluative component of collaboration, right? I mean, you get the evaluation asynchronously, but when you're working synchronously, things like rhythm and emphasis and, you know, some of the extra aspects of language and communication come into play in a way that's harder to have when you have that more, you know, you're each going to a blackboard, essentially, yeah, yeah, that yeah, kind of thing, yeah. and leaving notes for each other. So I think that there are parts of it, and I think especially when we're talking about these higher level aspects of learning, like metacognitive stuff, mm -hmm. that a, a synchronous exchange could be very valuable if we could figure out a way to do that. Sure. Yeah. Good. Thank you. No? Actually, uh, in the clinical activity, since I'm also, I was also a student in, in the clinical center, uh, activity, uh, when it was we are in Indiana, and now I was part of the designer team in design in the school. And uh, I can say that it is a mix of both. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. And um, so for for my part. Well, as a student, we do the synchronous uh, collaboration as much as we could because uh, when it is more synchronous, we can get more, um, like Dr. Rosen has said, more um, immediate feedback from the students. And from our online evaluation of this new critical thinker tool, students also report that with this synchronous interaction with, with their online peers, although they're anonymous to each other, they feel more confident, they feel more connected, because they know that someone was there monitoring their activities, and they feel sort of secured, and they feel that they were more confident to post this, and their product of these argumentative outcomes are more valid. Interesting, yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. So I'm going to go to uh, TK's got a couple questions for you online, if you don't Great. mind, and you know TK. So uh, a couple questions he has. One is it, to define the term um, free scale, 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 scale free. Uh, you mentioned it when you were uh, referencing uh, Scott Clemmer. And then the second one is he'd like to know a little bit about the size. What are you finding in terms of an effective size of these groups? and? Five, ten, a hundred, a thousand. What, what's the, you know, what are the magic numbers yeah. there? So, okay. Uh, well, scale-free just means that it uh, a technique works the same at any scale. So it doesn't have uh, it doesn't have a, uh, a scaling ceiling. So the kinds of uh, management that I do in my face-to-face -face class is not scale-free because I'm a scaling constraint mm -hmm. <laughs> in the room is a scaling constraint. yes yes yeah right. mm -hmm. yeah so uh but to answer the second question we have not done um there is research on this uh but we have not done with our activity 
specific work looking at uh, trade-offs or uh, performance characteristics of different size groups. So I have to give a kind of a practitioner answer mm. and say that I, I, I really like to have groups of four. I think that's a great size, uh, but I can't always do that. So I'd say four to six. I wouldn't have a group of seven. But this is really just a pr practitioner, you know. <laughs> well, we draw, we draw a lot it's, from. It's what yeah, I. Yeah, it's yeah, what yeah. I do. Okay. You know. So what would what would work or what the boundary conditions are? I don't know. Yeah. And I think the way you sell most things in education is you try them. You know. And so other people. Uh, that's why I have been trying to get other faculty to use this tool, and why I want to explore other scales because we can learn. We can learn some answers to that question. It's a very valid question. Sure. Good. Thank you. So let me. Um, I'm just going to glance online here. I, I I don't see an immediate question coming up, but let me turn to the room. Any questions for Jack or his team? So if not, I I have a list, but I want to. I don't want to monopolize the uh, the questioning. Lisa. I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more about what parts of this process are synchronous. I think I misunderstood from your last answer. I, was, I wasn't expecting you to say what you said. So can you just kind of spell out what's synchronous, what's asynchronous? So, so I'm answering uh, with respect to the, the current implementation that I'm using in my current class, what's synchronous. The tool, uh, the biggest difference was the tool itself. Piazza is not synchronous. Piazza has to actually have explicit saves. And because you, it's possible for people to access it at the same time, you actually can lose data. Because you get into these scenarios where the first person to save, uh, their buffer is saved and yours is gone, right? So that's a really bad design. You know, it's, it's um, I mean, nothing against the Piazza people. They're very uh, supportive of us, but they really have no chance of staying in business, I think, if they don't change their technology. Uh, it's way out of date. So, uh, so when we left it behind, we created a synchronous uh, uh, infrastructure for our system. So as Nas said in the, in the uh, video, you can be typing in several of those text panes at the same time, and the system can keep that straight, and no data is lost. So that's synchronous now, and it used to be asynchronous. Uh, the, all the other things are uh, basically managed face-to-face, -face, uh, so that's synchronous. So it's, it is all synchronous now. Did you, what, what did you mean to say when you, yeah, I think you brought up the synchronous thing. I think so, that's yeah. working, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I'm not sure if you're asking about the tool or the activity. I was asking about the activity, but I yeah. appreciate the clarification on the tool. Yeah, so so do you want to speak to the activity? I think she's just asking, what do they do at the same time in class, and what do they do oh, on oh. their own time? Out yes, so so I referred to things like uh, uh, they, have to, they have to read and understand, in, in my current class, they have to read and understand the theory. Uh, they have to construct the pro-con arguments, and that could involve some re refinement. Then another group has to look at those arguments and synthesize and critique their, their pro-con analysis. And then we meet in class. So it's all asynchronous. It's staged through the week. And I use this as they're out-of-class group assignments. Uh, so I'm trying to... What I'm trying to do is keep them engaged with the course material, uh, keep them engaged with each other, and uh, you know, so usual read it, read it instructors do that. And also because if I did everything in class, I'd get like one tenth as much done. You know, but if I make it all. I think you use the word culminate. I have them do all this uh, preparatory work, and then it culminates in a plenary discussion and in, in class that. Just has more energy because of the work they did before. So I have a, a, a friend of mine, and, and uh, nice to see you, Michelle. It's been a while. Uh, Michelle Klein, who teaches tax law for Penn State, and uh, she's an accounting faculty member. She says that um, she believes this work could could 
this tool could fit into her senior level course since they are uh, analyzing tax issues and must always consider the pros and cons of various uh, tax, uh, tax laws and actions. She says currently they're using Collaborate, Collaborate uh, which is embedded, I believe, into Penn State's tool. Is that embedded into Canvas? And, um, but she said it's difficult when you're geographically dispersed, and she's wondering if this is a tool that might be Blackboard, yes, right, right, Blackboard Collaborate, if it might be embedded into, uh, is this a tool that is ac accessible to someone like Michelle in order to work with her students who are literally around the globe? Is that for online? Yeah. I mean, the answer is in principle, yes, but uh, the limitation is the tool is supported by us and that there is, that's not scale free. That's not scale free. <laughs> that's not scale free. Ah, now we know where the term scale free comes from. So, um, so I, I'm wondering if, if, you know, it seems to me the skill set you're you're working on and trying to develop in students, whether it's undergraduate or graduate level, is just an absolutely critical part of of what we do in education. Uh, and I'm not sure we do enough of it. Uh, and I'm wondering this tool and this tool application seems to me to apply to almost every field. I'd be hard pressed to think of a field that it doesn't apply to, right? So what's, what's the potential, if you think out of this, is this a product that we can embed into say Canvas and it's a, it's a tool set or it's an app that I can embed into my Canvas class. I now add CT and now I can build out my STEM and then I can build out, is that, is that the hope? Uh, yes, that's one of the outputs of the NSF grant we're proposing. That's why Coursera is a partner, is as okay. uh, far as the MOOCs are concerned. We're wanting to support small group. The Google connection, yeah, that's in some part to just so we can avoid having to build the infrastructure yeah. in the yeah. short term. But the mm. long term goal is to have this accessible in many uh, veins and certainly. One of them could be uh, the world case. So you would need, I'm thinking now, the scale free part, you would need, it's the, the database engine in the back that's going to house and maintain the right. content, which is one of the scale issues. Yeah, so the technical scale issues, I think, are certainly overcomable relatively easy without significant amounts of research okay. at all, maybe even none. It's, I mean, we're talking 10, 100,000. That's mm -hmm. something that has been done. The things that are scale are not scale free at the moment are things like how do you do peer assessment, how do you do group governance, and these are the yeah. So mm. do you let the group self govern? I mean, it's all the plumbing around the activity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah how yeah. do you design the policies even for the system? So once we mm. have policies in hand, the actual implementation is almost not trivial, but it's not pioneering research, but the, the research is in how do you support all those things? Yeah, yeah. What are they, what does that even look like, you know? So can I ask, are you looking at this point for additional faculty who might be interested in using CT and part of and try and get in and provide feedback to you then as a, as a tool? Is that, will you learn from that process? Is that what you desire? That is one thing we desire. I mean, the, the, uh, a, uh, a boundary on that is is our effort, you know, the effort we can we can put into this. But that is one thing we desire because we also think this can apply to a wide a wide range of uh, courses and activities. I mean, uh, the three courses we've applied it to are the three that I teach and or have some stake in. So I've got a pretty limited uh, role at the university, but 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 we think it can be applied as you were suggesting to almost anything. I'm uh, being shown I got another question here. Uh, she, Michelle says, this is exactly what I would love to be able to do in my online courses. So my sense is she's going to be contacting you or, uh, or one of her <laughs> colleagues will be contacting you. So, Great. Yes. So a question is, uh, what might be the process for contacting? Who would they reach out to and say, hey, I've got this course. I might be interested in using Critical Thinker. Jack? Okay. Yeah. Start with Jack. So um, maybe at some point in, in our follow-up, Haley, we could set a, uh, we could put Jack's email out there. So Jack is also AKA John Carroll. So if, depending on what you're searching on, you uh, use the formal uh, in our 
phone directory system would be John. Um, so I had a, another uh, thought on this, and it has to do with that point about evaluation. And I'm wondering if you can share with us from your experiences so far, have you seen uh, the output uh, rise from the students in the terms of their, of their thinking process and their, what the points they're arriving to? Has it, with this tool, have you seen an increase in that level of that discussion and the thinking? Well, there's only, there was only one, we, we have several data sets, but there's only one that we've actually finally analyzed and published, which I cited in, in, the, in the talk. And yes, we did see that in there through the course of the course. There were four, there were actually six, two warm-up activities and then six books that they analyzed. And the quality of the critical argumentation improved through the, and we make that argument in that uh, published paper. We want to do similar analyses on other data sets we have, and we haven't, haven't done that yet, though. But the potential, I would think, is is there to, through the application of the process within the confines of this tool, to, to raise, again, I, I think just philosophy courses, education courses, I think there's so many courses that would benefit. Uh, I teach a leadership development program in the summertime, and, and we have an online portion, and I'm thinking I would love to use this as we're analyzing forces that are affecting higher education right now. This would be a, a, a wonderful tool to be able to use for that kind of a dialogue and discussion. And, and going back to the, the core, when I read through the abstract again, I thought it, it is about us developing the ability to have critical thinking and rational outcomes. Well, what you would hope to lead to rational outcomes. One, one thing that might be um, useful, Jack, is for you, if, if you have anything to comment on Remember how you used to run your HCI theory course with groups, and they were sort of debating and doing some kind of constructive, collaborative activity, but they weren't using this format of the pro-con. So you could say there was kind of implicit critical thinking, but it wasn't called out as much. Do you notice any difference? In, you know, I know that's, that's a hard question, question because yeah. you've been part of it. From the beginning, so but if you just say look back four or five years to how you ran your class and how you're doing it now, is there anything that comes to mind? Sorry. <laughs> uh, actually, I don't know what kind of answer I could give. Really, I mean, I've been teaching this class actually for more than twenty years, and uh, it's it's improved every year. <laughs> Okay. It's really good. <laughs> Not to be biased or anything, but it's, it's brilliant if I have to say it. It's brilliant. But you know, Mary Beth, you bring up, you raise a really interesting point in that is sometimes I think as a researcher, you're, you're so close to the content, you don't notice those somewhat incremental improvements right, over right. time until you step back and think, what was it like 10 years yeah. ago or 20 years ago when I didn't have these tools? And you think, geez. Um, the difference is now when I come into the classroom, students are better prepared. Uh, they have more, they've already had an exchange using Critical Thinker online, so now in the classroom they're better prepared to have these interactions. You know, and you might not have thought about that until you sort of do that reflective piece. So I, I think it's a good question. It yeah. probably takes a little bit more thinking, reflection on Jack's part. I'll just, I'll just give a quick, for instance, because I, I have over those years mm -hmm. substituted for Jack. You know, a fair amount. <laughs> um, and so I remember coming in in the substitute instructor role back in the olden days when it was, you know, you had your, your groups, but not the critical thinking activity. And if I just had to say, I mean, I haven't seen your classes these days, so I haven't been there, but it was a sort of a more siloed thing. You know, every little team had its role and they did their piece but the other teams were just kind of reactive. And it seems like what you've set up now is they are more prepared, mm -hmm. right? They kind of know what the arguments are going to be and they've thought about, you know, in some cases written about what they think about those arguments. And so, so they're starting at yeah, a higher level. At a yeah, higher level. Yeah, I'm yeah. just feeding that to you, Jack. Well, I, I mean, I think that might be true, but like a lot of people, you know, I'm, I'm – uh, like, like everybody who does anything, I'm getting better, and yeah. uh, and I, one thing I do that really strictly doesn't have to do with this uh, 
critical thinking intervention, but I, I use jigsaw. So the groups that um, work in class together are not the groups that worked on these projects through the week that I just discussed. And the reason for that is that I feel they've already shared a lot uh, through the week on their getting the argument together. Then I put them into different groups in class where they have to represent the teamwork that they did during the week with new people who did different teamwork in different roles through the week. And yeah, but actually once you get the permutations done, you know, it, it just runs like a program. <laughs> but I think that, you know, that has nothing to do with critical thinking per se, but it makes the class discussions much more animated. So it's hard to tease out sort of, yeah. have you gotten better in your teaching and, and more refined, yeah. and, you know, so, but I, I'm, I'm just, uh, Really yeah. thrilled to see this product and to see where you folks have, have taken this, and uh, the potential I think is tremendous. So uh, I'm, I'm, I hope we find ways to continue to encourage you and support you uh, where we can in this. This is this is really good stuff. Um, any other last questions for our guests? Lisa, it's not so much a question as a comment because I was just jotting down the notes. I forget if it was Mary Beth or somebody else who said what you get from synchronous kind of discussion, the rhythm, the emphasis, the immediate feedback, somebody was mentioning those things. And I wonder if <clears throat> they're using critical thinker and being prepared for a discussion, now think about the online learner, can the online discussion then be less reliant on the instructor because the students are more prepared to have a discussion that could be synchronous then, that they sign up for a time to have it, and this is paving the way for different ways to think about online. Everything works as hoped. Sorry. I just said if everything works as hoped. Very good. All right, well, please join me in thanking Jack and his colleagues for very <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks. And uh, who knows, maybe in a year we'll get back together again and see where you are. And, and if you're interested in uh, Critical Thinker as an application within a course you're teaching or supporting, Please reach out, let Jack know, or contact one of us. We'll get you in contact with Jack. But thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And thank you to our guests online as well. Best wishes.